critiques of modernism being cold, being without the richness and appeal, uh, the variations, uh, the, the subtle distinctions, the moments of surprise, the moments of unpredictability that were oftentimes valued in traditional architecture came into question. Rather than seeking to find those moments in good modern building, modernism went through a period of being dismissed. Um, all of the failures of modern architecture can't be placed on the buildings alone. Uh, granted, there were questionable interpretations of modernism. Uh, one, the, uh, probably the undoing of modernism is that it's a very different thing when you look at a curtain wall that has been rigorously detailed by an architect like Mies van der Rohe or Warren Seagraves with every piece of steel extruded specifically for that project versus a building that was done in rather more economical uh, conservative circumstances and the parts came, shall we say, off the rack. Um, one might compare uh, some of the um, schools that were done by leaders of the, of the modern movement on a national scale, Paul Rudolph's work, some of which critically has been lost, even in our own state. I know there are buildings by, um, school buildings by Wittenberg, Delaney, and Davidson, school buildings by the Cromwell firm that have that same careful attention to detail and space making, but for every one of those, there was also the trickle down the feedback of the building that wasn't put together so well. And again, modern buildings do not age well. Many of them didn't survive. Many of them were let go. Um, I think that our consciousness about mid-century modernism is instructive because I think we really do go through a very capricious and architecturally historically unsound cycles of judgment and popular taste that influence what we value and what we disdain and have a dramatic influence on what we preserve, what we save, and what we let go. You know, if I, if I turn the clock back to the 1970s when I was first starting to do work in preservation, um, you had to make a pretty good argument for an Art Deco building. If you turn the clock back even further, the height of the modern movement, um, the classical revival buildings of the turn of the century that now everybody waxes eloquently about and bemoans the losses of, the, the great uh, Pennsylvania station which was lost in New York City. Uh, those were buildings that in the 1960s when they were lost uh, were looked at as so many mid-century modern buildings are being looked at now. Uh, there's deterioration, is it cost effective? Does this building make sense in this place and time? What we love, what we hate, what is popular, what is unpopular, what our taste cultures move us to is a sliding scale and a moving target. And to a certain degree, mid-century modernism literally is coming to age where there's just enough distance to look at the 1950s as something that is history. It's very hard for us to see history in the making. It's very hard for us to construct that the chronicle of the past began five minutes ago, not 50 years ago. And this, I think, has blemished uh, very much the consideration of mid-century modernism. It's hard for people to talk about mid-century modernism, too, and that's in large part why I wish there was far more focus on this idea of an historical collective, on an idea of how we lived in the 1950s that was different from everything that came before it, the values that emerged in the 1950s that were unique to a place and time in American culture getting beyond 
the inability, um, I would argue, outside of the architecture community and in some sectors outside of the preservation community to talk responsibly about a very simple, unornamented, geometric, no-nonsense architecture to talk lucidly about an architecture that takes pride in the way things are made and made well and made for the state of the art. That's difficult, or at least it's proven to be difficult. And I think that the problems with preserving mid-century buildings hearken to all uh, of those issues.